morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of our participants who are joining us from around the world. I'm delighted to open this event to mark the launch of Inter Paris's new publication on gender sensitive parliamentary scrutiny. We're posting a link to the guide in the chat now so you can access it uh, as the meeting goes along. Inter Paris is an, an EU funded peer to peer parliamentary eh, para development los, program, uh, programas de desarrollo. Um, delivered by International Idea that is designed to support the strengthening of democracy worldwide. Today, more than ever, we are reminded of the critical importance and power of democracy. And I would like to take a moment to express our solidarity with the women and men of Ukraine. Gender equality, of course, is core to the strength, legitimacy, and effectiveness of democracy. Parliaments are key institutions in the fight for gender equality, both through equal representation of diverse communities, but also through the decisions that parliaments make. Our gender sensitive scrutiny guide provides a flexible framework for embedding gender into parliamentary oversight and lawmaking. It promotes the idea of gender sensitive scrutiny as good scrutiny, not a nice to have, but an essential. The framework was developed based on the experiences and the expertise of European Union member state parliaments and our partner parliaments in emerging democracies around the world. And this reflects the inter Paris peer to peer approach. But the concepts in this publication are not confined to the pages of the document. They are alive in inter Paris's activities to support parliamentary development. We hope that the ideas, the experiences, the stories and guidance in the publication will make a valuable contribution to parliamentary culture and practice and empower parliaments to understand themselves as institutions of power, decision-making and progress on gender equality. Our event today aims to stimulate a discussion about how parliamentary oversight and lawmaking can advance gender equality in society. And I look forward to hearing the views and the experiences of our fantastic panelists. We are very honored to be joined today by Fabien van den Ede, a longtime advocate for both democracy and gender equality who will be making introductory remarks. Fabienne is currently Deputy Head of UNIT of the International Partnership, Directorate General of the European Commission, dealing with gender equality, human rights and democratic governance. This unit oversees, among other things, the thematic program for human rights and democracy, the European Union Gender Action Plan 2020 to 2025, and the Spotlight Initiative to End Violence Against Women and Girls, an initiative that Fabienne herself directly coordinates. Fabienne has 22 years of experience in the European Commission, working mainly in development cooperation, dealing with both financial and operational issues in relation to a wide range of countries and geographic areas. She has also served eight years overseas in European Union delegations in Kenya, Somalia, and in Zambia, working on financial and contractual issues, democratic governance, and social sectors. Fabienne studied international and diplomatic relations in Brussels, and financial management in Antwerp, Belgium. Very honored uh, for you to make opening remarks and over to you, Fabienne. 
Jonathan, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to hear the very long introduction about me. So that's very nice. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be here with you today to launch together this guide on gender sensitive scrutiny. Uh, and I'm looking very much forward to the discussions, to the panel discussions. And as Jonathan said, this uh, launch is organized in the framework of our flagship program, a program which is personally close to my heart as well, which is Inter Paris. As Jonathan mentioned, it's true, parliaments are central, are a central institution of democracy. And they represent, they scrutinize, they exercise oversight, and they make laws. And where, of course, it's essential that women are sitting in these parliaments, say, eh, are parliamentarians, it's equally important that parliaments are indeed gender responsive, gender sensitive, which means that they can really respond to the needs, to the challenges, to the interests of both uh, men and women, and that they are sensitive to remove these barriers, uh, which we too often see for the full participation of uh, women. As highlighted in the guide, which I had the pleasure to read, we now need to move from reaction to action, and we have to work proactively on gender equality. And our hope is, of course, that we really, that this guide can help doing that, can help parliamentarians to really embed gender equality into their daily work. As a last point, and as EU representative, I would like to take the opportunity to refer to our gender action plan, which is the ambitious roadmap that we've set up end of 2020 to work on gender equality, promote gender equality and women empowerment within the EU, and where one of our key areas of engagement is the promotion of equal participation and leadership of women and girls. Last year, during 2021, nearly 120 delegations have submitted their detailed country level implementation plans, which is a new tool that has been uh, foreseen in the gender action plan to really have a joined up and agreed upon strategy uh, anchored at country level uh, to promote uh, gender equality. And in these plans, we have seen that uh, promoting the leadership and the participation of women and girls is in the top three priorities put forward by our delegations and by our member states. So I would say this is something to really look forward to, which we will further follow up and in which we will can be able to continue our commitment in this very important area. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Fabienne, for those, for those encouraging uh, and informative comments. Um, I would like now to hand over to Hannah Johnson, Senior Gender Advisor with the InterParis Project, and uh, Hannah will be taking us uh, from now on. Hannah. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And um, I'm delighted to welcome our first panel, who I will now invite to turn their cameras on if, the, if everybody's there. Um, so this, this first panel is um, uh, uh, comprised of academics and practitioners. Um, we're gonna have a short discussion on the theory and principles of gender sensitive scrutiny. And I'm really delighted to be joined by uh, Sonia Palmieri, who's a policy fellow in gender at Australian National University. And I think it's fair to say an internationally renowned pioneer on gender sensitive parliaments and the concept. We also have Sasha Gavrich, a gender officer at the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and who's a practitioner with many years of experience of gender sensitive parliamentary transformation. Ramona Vijayarasa is a senior lecturer at the University of Technology in Sydney and the brains behind the amazing Gender Legislation Index, which is a tool that's really worth exploring in case you haven't come across it before. And last but never least, we have Maria Musmuti, an Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and Executive Director of the Centre for European Constitutional Law, and who's also an expert in gender sensitive legislative scrutiny. And uh, we don't have much time together, so I'll jump straight into my first question, which is, to what extent do you think that gender parity and political representation results in more gender sensitive decisions being made in Parliament? And um, maybe does it matter as well? Sonia, can I come to you first, please? Of course. Hello. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you, Into Paris, for this lovely opportunity. Um, I'm going to be slightly controversial and say, well, I don't think that the link between gender parity and gender sensitive decisions should be causal. I want to see gender parity in parliaments. I want to see 
gender sensitive decisions being made, but I don't want one to be dependent on the other. I think that's obvious because otherwise we will constantly expect women to, to be responsible for gender sensitive decisions. And when they can't for a range of reasons, then it's their fault. Um, so clearly I would like to see a parliament that values gender sensitive decisions and processes being adopted by all parliamentarians, regardless of gender. Thank you so much for that, Sonia. Um, Sasha, can I come to you next, please? Thank you, Hannah. Well, I will second uh, Sonia's um, first um, statement, as I'm also not uh, fully a fan of the angle of the questions, uh, of the question. I really believe that ensuring gender balanced uh, presence and re representation must be achieved independently from the discussion if women's presence leads uh, to a change in decision making. The danger is that um, if we link women's presence to the question if women create change is that we might inspire some mean people to uh, conclude, well, in, not in all cases, it does lead to uh, a change in the decision making. And they might also then question the overall advocacy on women's political uh, participation. Uh, uh, from my point of view, women's political participation must be really guaranteed independently from the discussion on what type of influence women have. Um, and now to the question, well, women's uh, presence leads uh, to women, uh, women's and intersectional voices being articulated in the deliberation of uh, decisions. And um, I believe uh, that it, women in parliaments play a really key role in ensuring women's substantive representation. Nevertheless, I would be, of course, uh, very careful in uh, not overestimating uh, the role of women as women's substantive representation, and that's what we have learned from research, really depends also on other um, representation sites like uh, men and women that are present um, in governments or, uh, or of course, the role of uh, women's uh, movements. And um, they all together to conclude, uh, contribute to a shift, I would say, towards gender responsive decision making. Making. Thank you, Sasha. Maria, do you have any thoughts on this? Can I come to you next? Um, yes, Hannah, and thank you once again for the invitation and congratulations for the excellent work. Um, in my mind, gender sensitive scrutiny is about introducing um, a gender perspective in the decision making. And although I agree with uh, both Sonia and Sasha, I think that, you know, making sure that all genders are represented and also intersectional approaches are represented uh, uh, does have something to do uh, with uh, enriching this discussion and making this discussion uh, inclusive. So I totally agree that I wouldn't like to see the one being dependent on uh, the other. So gender sensitive scrutiny should be taking place in any uh, any way. But I do think that making sure that we have an inclusive and representative uh, parliament, uh, uh, all genders and also uh, people with disabilities, different ages, you know, different ethnic uh, origin is is can add a qualitative dimension in, in this um, discussion. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Maria, for those great points. And finally, Ramona, can I come to you? Thank you, Hannah. And, and like everyone else, it's an absolute pleasure to join you for tonight's launch. I think Sasha and Sonia have articulated very well the importance of gender parity as an end goal, so that parliaments are equally seen as a place for women. And Maria so nicely brought intersectionality to the table. And I would extend that by saying, you know, we recall the old adage that you cannot be what you cannot see. And so it's also about fellow women and a diverse group of women being able to see parliament as a place for them. I would add one other dimension, which is a different type of diversity, which is diversity of issue. Because some of the research does hint that gender parity drives up gender sensitive outcomes, but in very specific areas. We do have a greater capacity to conduct gender sensitive scrutiny in areas of law, such as gender based violence or women at work or women's health. What I would love to see is if we drove up gender parity, we'd also see a greater set of expertise at the legislative table to conduct gender sensitive scrutiny on other areas of law 
that are so often forgotten but are pivotal to advance women's rights. So women in tax, gender in company law, gender in the environment. And that's where I think we would see a really nice connection between gender parity and gender sensitive scrutiny. Thanks, Thank Hannah. Thank you so much, Ramona. And thanks for bringing that additional point to the table. Um, I think I agree with you that, and I think I say this in the guide that it's not just women's responsibility to do this, it's everybody's responsibility. Um, so secondly, I'd really like to explore a bit more about how gender sensitive scrutiny can be widely understood as good scrutiny and not just a nice to have. And additional to that kind of how we can move beyond preaching to the converted on this, which I think is some, a trap that we can often fall into. Um, Maria, can I come to you first on this, please? Sure. Um... It's an important point, and I think I was thinking a lot on what to say on, 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 on this question. And I think for me, uh, first of all, gender sensitive scrutiny is for everyone. It's not just for women, it's for men and women and everyone else out there. And it's about having effective laws, laws that work for, ev that work for everyone, independently of their um, uh, gender. But when it comes to what, how can we ensure good scrutiny, I think it's a question of method, having a method and making sure that we do address the issues that are gender sensitive in the process of making decisions is of paramount importance. We've, we cannot do it without uh, a method we need or a thinking process. I don't care if it's a structured method or, but uh, as long as the questions are asked and there, there's discussion and there are answers around them, for me, we are on the good, uh, in the good, we are moving in the right uh, direction. And I very much uh, would like to stress Ramona's point that it needs to affect all different, all kinds of policies and not just policies that have an obvious gender tag. It has to do with everything, yeah. Thank you, Maria. And I'd echo what Ramona said about gender and tax. That's something that's come up a lot in our discussions about gender sensitive scrutiny with partner parliament. Um, Ramona, can I actually come to you next to ask that question, please? Sure, Hannah, and I'd be happy to go next because I really like that Maria's really emphasised method. And I think that's what we need to move from a nice to have to something that is a given by focusing on method and a set of questions. Because to me, what, what is a potential link here is reminding everyone that gender sensitive scrutiny is a binding obligation. And I speak here as an international women's rights lawyer and through my experience creating the Gender Legislative Index, it's an index that happens to be based on CEDAW and many know the convention well and I suppose what's really rich about the, the opportunity the convention provides is that it's signed up to by almost all nations and the CEDAW convention and the committee members have required countries to conduct gender sensitive scrutiny and the convention and the 38 general recommendations provide the benchmarks for the conducting of that gender sensitive scrutiny. The Gender Legislative Index actually offers seven CEDAW based questions to do that gender sensitive scrutiny. And I think if we can tighten this link between the international obligation to do this and the practice, perhaps that's how we can move from a nice to have to a common practice. Can I just be um, unfair and ask you an extra question on that, Ramona, about do you think that parliaments are particularly good at doing that currently? Do you think that they're particularly bad? What's your feeling after, after the work that you've been doing? My sense is that it's very haphazard and that's why this is such an important question. So it is taking place in some instances, but it is not a systematic practice. And I think that's really fundamental, that this is not just something that can happen when the right person is in the room, the right legislator has the pen, or a parliamentary body says this is a women's issue, gender sensitive scrutiny needs to happen. It has to happen all the time. What I think is really interesting and exciting about the next panel is where I think this has happened well in certain parliaments, it's where nations feel a tendency to want to borrow from each other. Maybe they may be, have cultural ties, they may have geographic ties, and I think that's when um, parliaments are more likely to look to neighbouring parliaments to see how well has it been done somewhere else. So gender sensitive scrutiny doesn't need to be a solo exercise. It can also be about borrowing good practice from neighbouring parliaments. But to me, the, the, what's, we're not seeing systematic practice and that's, that's what this report is so nicely calling for. Thank you so much, Ramona. Um, Sonia, can I come to you next? Yeah, absolutely. So I think 
the discussion so far has been very much around institutional mechanisms. And I completely agree. I think it needs to be coupled with an institutional culture. So while I, I think mandates help, we also have to see pressure. And the pressure really comes both internally and externally. It comes from critical actors inside the parliament who are the drivers. But then there are also, as Sasha said very, very well, the kind of the people outside the parliament who also put that pressure on, who kind of call for it and then call accountability when it's not happening. Um, but in addition, we want that process around monitoring and reporting so that then we kind of see the results. So how often is it done? What has it led to? What kinds of changes does that make? Um, and, and what is the effect of those? So the processes are really important, those institutional mechanisms, but there is also something that has to be said around culture so that it becomes that habit. So it's that systematizing of those mechanisms. Because I think we've seen in parliaments before, a mandate is not enough. So yes, I mean, I think, I think Ramona's right. International obligations are in effect that mandate, but they haven't been enough in and of themselves. And so there need to be those other bits that create the habit that change the culture. I love that point, Sonia, about the importance of pressure and the motivation to conduct this, not like just being a, a, a system, a, a, a rule that someone has to abide by. Sasha, can I bring you in finally? Well, yeah, I will try to be uh, re really short also in, in, in respect of the, of the time. Uh, just to complement this um, discussion on the institutional mechanisms and the institutional culture, I would say uh, one sentence, and that's basically a call for academia and international partners to really uh, be the supporter in this process by presenting examples of impact and uh, by demonstrating the benefits of gender sensitive scrutiny, because that's what will for sure um, help us in moving beyond preaching uh, to the converted and uh, hopefully uh, enable us to um, reach all members of the parliament. Thank you so much for that, Sasha. Um, I've got another question, which is, um, what are the success, success factors that you've seen in improving the gender sensitivity of laws, policies, programs and budgets? Um, can I come to you first, Maria, um, specifically on the law, I imagine? <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Yes, um, I mean, I would just like, I think everything has been said, so I would just like to bring it together. I think a method is needed. I think it needs to be consistent. So we cannot do it once and then forget about it or only do it when someone is pushing or where someone is interested. It needs to find its place in the scrutiny um, uh, process. I agree with Sonia's point about culture. I agree about having the mechanisms. And another point I would like to add, is that I think it should take place throughout the life cycle of legislation and policy. Uh, we have to do it proactively because it's a very important point in time when to scrutinize potential gender impact. We have to monitor implementation, but we also have to do it ex post to see how things have worked and to pick up what hasn't worked and try to correct it. And it is equally important, but I would like to stress the point about the importance of proactive um, uh, scrutiny and how, 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 um, how crucial that is in order for that to make a difference. And my final point is what Sasha, Sasha said about impact. We need to show how this can make a difference and we need to show it in a way that it's so obvious that no one can, can, can uh, deny that. And I think this is, this is important for, for uh, making it consistent and, and integrating it and embedding it in existing processes. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Sasha, can I come to you next? Because you've had lots of experience of, of, of being a practitioner on the ground in this in this respect. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to continue. I would like to maybe go one step back from, from Maria and to reflect a little bit on Odir's work um, in uh, development countries in the Balkans, Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, and uh, where really gender sensitive scrutiny is at the beginning in, in a lot of cases and is sometimes even not, not a term that is known to the, to the people. In those cases, I'm, uh, my con key conclusion is really that 
the success factors are the wish for um, or the intention for change and the readiness for a critical review of existing procedures. Um, if the parliaments don't see the internal need to make the, uh, things better, then also any form of external support uh, will not work. Um, this means that critical actors from the international community um, or academia are in the position to inspire change, but real success will only come if the parliament, with its critical actors in, inside, as Sonia has, has said, uh, if they want to change the way how things have been done since since ever so time or, or since how things have been have been done so far um, one uh, once this wish uh, for change has kicked in um, I I believe really that the role of Parliament is to develop um, uh, the clear tools and procedures, what our colleagues call the methods, making really gender sensitive scrutiny a regulatory obligation and not something that depends on voluntary checklists. Um, speaking also from the experience in Eastern Europe, um, uh, I will and I will close with that. I really believe that parliaments are, in the majority of cases, very formal institutions, and gender sensitive scrutiny needs to be part of those formal rules. I would completely agree with that, Sasha. Thank you. Um, Ramona, finally, can we can we come to you? Sure. I really appreciate that Sasha earlier mentioned that we don't necessarily know and have the evidence that gender sensitive scrutiny leads to positive outcomes. I think this is really important to show a gap. And the fact that the term gender sensitive scrutiny remains somewhat unfamiliar in certain contexts shows us how far we have to go. So I think drawing this correlation, collecting that evidence to show that gender sensitive scrutiny actually has a positive outcome, I think is a really important future direction. But in terms of what may be a possible um, success factor, if we even know what can say what they are, I, th I think it's data. Because we can't conduct gender sensitive scrutiny if we don't know the problem the law is really trying to fix and we don't collect data that's disaggregated across a range of identities. So we are much better at conducting in many countries gender disaggregated data, but we're not disaggregating to the level where we can talk about disability or sexual orientation or let alone non-binary data. And without that data, I think it's very hard to then conduct the gender sensitive scrutiny. So to me, a success factor is that the different arms of government are doing their part. You've got your data collection, you've got your legislators doing the gender sensitive scrutiny, you have your budgeters financing and backing the law, and then you are monitoring for implementation. But data is that initial first step. I think you're completely right. And it's something that comes up over and over again about that disaggregated data getting down to a more granular level. Um, as you can see, we're, we're really running out of time, but I do want to ask my final question, which is what do you think that is um, one thing that MPs can do to conduct gender sensitive oversight and lawmaking? Um, Sonia, can I come to you first? Can I just say, Hannah, this is a very hard question because no. obviously there are multiple steps <laughs> that many of us on this panel have identified. So I think um, in having to crystallize it, I've come up with a very simple, almost deceptively simple point. You have to practice it. You actually have to do it. And you have to do it all the time, even if you don't do it well. But you have, if you don't actually practice it, you won't get it right. Um, you won't know what data you need. Uh, I completely 100% agree with you, Ramona. We need better data. Um, but if you don't do it, you don't know what data you need. Um, so that's my that's my one kind of really important thing, just practice. That's an excellent piece of advice, Sonia. Um, Ramona, what would yours be? I think Sonia nailed it because there are the tools in this report, there are tools out there to operationalise this practice. So it is about practice, but I suppose going to Sonia's earlier point, listen to the push. You know, civil society is so such a critical part of this conversation. It's not necessarily going to be the case that legislators in Parliament have the expertise, know what's happening, especially for more marginalised and suppressed individuals whose experiences may not be that well known. Listen to the push from civil society to be conducting this gender sensitive scrutiny in the first place. I love that term, listen to the push. That's going to stick in my mind, I think. Um, Sasha, can I come to you next? Well, I would go one step further for, uh, from, from the last sentence that Ramona said, and is not just listen, but actively reach out 
uh, and established strategic co collaboration with women's movement and civil society organizations. And there again, I'm speaking really from, from a perspective of the Balkans, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where parliaments tend to be very close, uh, closed institutions and, and um, they lack uh, strategic cooperation with women's movement. It is not about um, only the, the individual data collection that an MP will, will con uh, conduct in, 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 in exchange, but I would also call on MPs to advocate for a more formalized inclusion of women's movements and civil society organizations in parliamentary um, committees. As said earlier, women's movements um, are an important side where women's interests are represented and they can be equally important uh, to the formal political institutions like parliaments. So yeah, st strengthen and be proactive in, in your cooperation with women's movements. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. And finally, Maria, can I come to you? Yes, um, I think the one thing I would say to MPs is that not to forget that their laws and policies address real men and women who are out there, men, women and non-binary people, and that if they really want to do things right, they need to be in the, to, they need to um, uh, walk into other people's shoes and walk around them and try to see what happens. And for me, that's the essence of scrutiny. That's the essence of gender sensitive uh, scrutiny, asking the questions and try to provide questions as Sonia uh, uh, said, there's no other way and you need to keep doing it until you uh, get it right. And if you don't get it right proactively, you have the, the opportunity to correct it <laughs> while it's being implemented, but you still need need to ask the questions and go uh, over them using data, using everything that you have. That's all from me. Thanks, Maria. And I love that link between representation and empathy and understanding that different people have different experiences and different needs. Thank you so much to my first panel. Um, your answers were so insightful and concise, and I very much appreciate both of those things. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to invite our second panel to turn their cameras on and if the first panel could turn their cameras off. Um, and second panel today will discuss the experiences and practicalities of embedding gender into lawmaking and oversight from the perspective of MPs. And I'm delighted to be joined by firstly the Vice Speaker of the Italian Chamber of Deputies, Honourable Honorable Maria Adera Spadoni, who has spearheaded a innovative initiative on gender analysis of draft legislation. I'm also joined by uh, YB Fuzia Sale, the chair of the Parliament of Malaysia's subcommittee on gender equality, which has been successful in influencing government decision making on gender. I'm also delighted to be joined by the Honourable Jeremy Wangchuk of the Parliament of Bhutan, who has many years of experience and enthusiasm for integrating a gender and human rights perspective into his work as an MP. And finally, we're joined by Deputy Holly Kens of the Irish Eroctus, who's a member of the Children, Disability and Equality Committee, and also a member of the Parliament's recent review to make the Parliament more inclusive and family friendly. <laughs> And I'd like to start this session um, if Honourable Wang Chuk and uh, Fuzia um, and Deputy Kens could um, turn their cameras on if, if they're with us. But I'd like to, to begin this session by asking about our panellists' experiences of embedding gender into their oversight and lawmaking work. Um, Maria Adera, could I come to you first because you've, your initiative is so fantastic and interesting. I'd love to hear more about it from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for giving me the floor. Uh, yes, I'm really happy to be here because uh, I finally um, have the opportunity to talk about what happened in, uh, uh, in Italy. So it all started in 2016 uh, when uh, the Italian Gender Budget Report uh, has provided an end of year data on both expenditures and revenues. So we have a, a gender budget report. And this report was, of course, uh, prepared by the Ministry of uh, Economy and uh, Finance. So we have the money. And uh, there was also a paragraph in which we could see if there was a gender impact, but about the money 
and uh, this budget was prepared by the ministry. So I thought, um, after what I saw uh, in this study, I thought, how about if we can create uh, an instrument, a tool, also for the MPs? for the member of parliament. Uh, so I decided in uh, 2020 to propose this uh, motion, which was, uh, uh, if uh, I remember well, uh, unanimously adopted by the parliament, in which I asked an experimental and selective provision to be made in the documentation files prepared by the research service on the draft legislation under consideration at the standing committees. Um, so what does that mean? It means that uh, um, a colleague prepares, thinks about a law. This law uh, has a paragraph as a technical note prepared by the research service, uh, which makes an incredible, an incredible service, an incredible work. And uh, um, in this technical note, you have a gender impact analysis. So this gender impact analysis is ex ante. What does that mean? It means that uh, the legislator, so the, the, the member, the MPs, have the possibility to, to see, to read this paragraph, uh, to see the law, and to think about a legislative measure, amendments, uh, changes, um, proposals, in order to change this law and make this law more uh, gender issued. So I, I thought that was, um, there was a really important uh, tool in order for, um, for, the, for the member of parliaments to have the possibility also to amend the, the legislation. So this uh, uh, motion that I um, prepared was adopted in 2020 and uh, starting from March 8th, 2021, the Italian parliament has started uh, to develop on an experimental basis, a specific analysis on gender impact. Uh, this was, um, a, it is also a good, a good start. It's a start point. It's not, uh, we are not getting to gender equality uh, tomorrow, but I believe it's a good start also for legislators, for, for legislators to, uh, to be able to have a different impact. Um, I, I, I heard the other panelists and uh, I absolutely agree when uh, they say that uh, also men have been included into the, pro into the process of gender equality. Uh, so I believe that also MPs, uh, male MPs have this opportunity when they see this, uh, uh, this uh, paragraph. So I was really happy about the, the adoption. And uh, of course, uh, again, it's uh, for sure it's not enough, but I think it's a good start point. Thank you so much. And I think you're completely right that it's a, an excellent starting point and it's really uh, unique, I think, in Parliament. And I can't wait to see how it progresses over time. I think having access to that information when on issues that might not immediately be relevant to gender in, in MPs' minds is so important. And I know that the research services done the analysis on, on tax bills and all sorts of things. It's fantastic. Um, Fuzia, can I come to you next to talk a bit about your work, please? Hi. Hi, Hena. Hi. So uh, thank you, Hena. Thank you very much. And um, very good uh, evening and uh, very good morning to uh, my other colleagues from the other side of the world. Um, with regards to my experience, just if you, uh, I would like to share my, a, a, a scene in parliament when I first uh, entered parliament back in 2008. Uh, I entered the cafe for MPs and it's a special cafe for MPs. And um, I, before that, none of the female MPs entered the cafe. Um, and I was wondering why. So when I walked in, I, I, I discovered that uh, it is uh, full of men smoking cigars and making sexist jokes. Uh, and I understood then why uh, the women MPs, the female MPs, uh, did not enter the, the um, uh, cafe. So what I did was I spoke to the speaker. And then it was very clearly a sign which says, no smoking. 
<laughs> no smoking in it. I mean, it's an air conditioned MP, MP cafe. And then who's happily smoking cigars. I mean, these are very veteran MPs. They've been there for ages. And nobody before that have, have uh, dared to say anything. But there was a very a junior MP walked in and I found that. And I complained. I was very loud about it. And uh, uh, the speaker was very nice. Uh, what he did was he put a stop to this um, activity. And there was a special area for smoking uh, in parliament. It was set up for smoking. And before that, it was nothing happened. So I made the, the cafe MP um, a place for all, not just for men smoking cigars. <laughs> so in the, since then, women have been able to walk into the cafe and, uh, and also have meetings and meet other MPs. So that's uh, the start of my career as a member of parliament uh, in, in my country. And since then, it is um, a lot of work. And uh, I realized that it needs a lot of um, political will to actually achieve uh, what uh, we want to do. So uh, one of our achievements, I heard about the gender action plan and I got very, very excited about the gender action plan by EU. So uh, Malaysia does not have a gender action plan. So uh, as women chief, as women chief um, in my party, well, since, since nobody's going to do it, so I decided to do it. So we launched a gender action plan and we launched the roadmap to gender equality in Malaysia. Uh, picking up from where uh, the Prime Minister said that he's committed to gender equality and picking up from there and I proposed a roadmap for the ministry to follow. And, um, and we have made quite a lot of um, breakthroughs in the Malaysian Parliament since 2008. We first started with a caucus for women MPs and then now we have a, a select committee that is functional, uh, which, which is um, I mean, for other parliament, uh, maybe it is something which is uh, the norm, but in Malaysia, it is quite an achievement. And also for 2023, following the roadmap that I proposed to the minister, um, a budget of 15 million Malaysian ringgit have been approved uh, to start uh, data collection and uh, collecting data, uh, sex disaggregated data at the granular level. And then that was also very exciting. Um, hopefully, we will be able to launch uh, the gender responsive budget uh, and, and use it next year. Uh, now, now the, mini the ministry is embarking on training and they contacted me recently on how, how to go about <laughs> training their staff. And uh, I'm also learning along the way, but however, uh, there is openness and um, we have be uh, begun uh, to embark on, on that journey. And I hope that uh, the process of gender uh, scrutiny will continue so that we can be on the uh, path to achieving uh, gender equality finally. I like what Ramona says, uh, what Ramona said just now about gender sensitive scrutiny uh, leading to positive outcomes. And I think we must be very, very clear in what are the outcomes. Because if we ourselves are not clear, I mean, the road to gender equality uh, from where we are now in Malaysia, where we, at, we are at about 121 in the gender global cap index, we are right down, very low down. Um, and, and to reach, to reach a, a, a destination that we want, of course, we need to know exactly what we need to achieve. We need to know what are the uh, points in the roadmap and uh, what are the achievements that uh, we need to have. So one of the things that I identify is first to start with data, to start with data and to start collecting data because when we have sex disaggregated data at the granular level, we, we will be able to have, a, have a, an analysis. Hopefully with that analysis, uh, we will be able to plan um, our budget in a more gender responsive way. So it's a long way, I think, for Malaysia, but at least uh, uh, we have started. And uh, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful uh, that the journey will, will bring us towards our destination of, of gender um, equality.
Thank you so much, Fuzia. And I love your storytelling at the beginning about that experience of upsetting the gender norms in Parliament and making it a place that women are welcome. That's fa and, and how you've progressed from then. Holly, can I come to you next about your Parliament's uh, review of its inclusivity and your experience on the Equality Committee? Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I'm delighted to be speaking at this event. Um, I think it's important for members of parliaments just to be able to share and learn from each other. Too often it can feel like, you know, you're the only country dealing with these issues. And, um, the, you know, it's great to just hear about the different successes and challenges and we can all learn from each other. Um, just because of the time zone, I did miss part of this meeting. So I'm sorry if I sort of overlap on some, anything else that somebody has said. Um, but yeah, the gender... Uh, sensitive scrutiny by yourself, Hannah, um, is an excellent document, I think, to help consider how we can make fairer and better laws. And I'd just like to raise three points kind of in relation to that document and the, the committee you're talking about. So firstly, I think your document just helped me understand um, an issue in the Irish Parliament, um, which I first raised in a, se in a session on International Women's Day yesterday, actually. Um, I find the topics of discussion tend to be kind of separated into general issues. Um, and then women or men specific issues. So, for example, there was a big focus on gendered issues yesterday. Um, but when we're discussing housing, there's little or no consideration given to gender. Um, but as the document explains, gender is a factor that influences all aspects of policy and lawmaking. And um, just to quote some part of that, just a little part of that, your publication it says decisions that ignore gender risk negatively affecting people's lives, providing ineffective solutions to problems unfairly or inefficiently allocating public funds and deepening existing inequalities. So you just clearly demonstrate kind of the importance of gender sensitive scrutiny as a lens. And I'll be pushing for more of that in the Irish Parliament. Um, I also really welcome the explanation of intersectionality because as well as gender, we have to consider aspects such as disability and climate in all our decisions. Um, and it's just really nice to see kind of articulated the way that you did. Um, these matters are all connected, but it can be difficult to understand and see them. Um, and we have an obligation to produce legislation and policy that is informed by evidence and best practice. And then secondly, um, we need a parliamentary environment that is receptive to discussions. And I was a member of that Family Friendly Law Committee um, was to set up an inclusive parliament. It was set up by our speaker, which in Ireland we call the Ken Corla, not the speaker. Um, and there were people from across Irish society, from business, uh, from NGOs and universities and they helped us kind of explore and understand the barriers to participation in that environment. Um, currently we have 22.5% of members in the parliament are women um, and really poor representation from minority or ethnic groups, um, almost non-existent. Um, we've made a series of recommendations that were designed to make the parliament more inclusive and would help establish greater gender sensitive scrutiny. Um, for example, at the moment, you can only participate in the Irish Parliament if you're on the precincts of Leinster House. So what happened like during the pandemic was we were attending committee meetings remotely. Um, but it's in our constitution that you have to be here to do it remotely. So, for example, I was driving four and a half hours to essentially go on to a Zoom meeting. <laughs> um, so the introduction of proxy voting and remote participation would mean a wider range of people could participate, especially young people with families. Um, could become members of the parliament. Um, unfortunately, we need to have a constitutional referendum to change that. Um, so I really hope that will happen soon. But just to give maybe a little bit of context as well, another thing that we need to have a constitutional referendum on in Ireland um, is that present, it says in our constitution that a woman's place is in the home. Um, and thirdly, just finally, as a, I think, you know, we as public representatives have an obligation to look at how we conduct gender sensitive um, oversight and lawmaking. We have to be part of the change and we have to use this document um, and encourage others to use it. So when considering issues, we already ask, um, is it economically viable? Um, how will it affect my constituents? And now we just have to add a gender scrutiny lens as another criteria um, to really interrogate our own work. And um, very finally, so it's just I want to say happy, happy International Women's Week uh, to everybody. There's plenty to celebrate as well. Um, as the many challenges. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much, Holly. That was fantastic. You managed to cover so many areas in uh, such a short time. And I very much support your point about all areas being um, uh, being able to, to be um, 
gender sensitive scrutiny being able to be conducted on many different issues. There aren't women's issues and men's issues and general issues. Um, Jeremy, can I come to you finally to speak about your experiences of this? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hannah, for inviting me to uh, today's, uh, uh, I should say, tonight's launch on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, gender guide. And uh, specifically talking about, I think uh, it is a very, very uh, interesting and it is very, uh, uh, how should I say, I mean, you know, very interesting and very, uh, uh, you know, everybody has a lot of knowledge about the gender sensitive scrutiny. My background is in, is in human rights. I've been working in the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for almost uh, near, near to 20 some years. So my background is only in the human rights. But at the same time, I always say my fellow parliamentarians here in Bhutan that uh, human rights is a women's rights. Women's rights is human rights. So, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, just to give you my, in a, in a nutshell, my experiences uh, in the past three years uh, as, a, as a parliamentarian here in Bhutan, I uh, think, uh, 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 gender sensitive scrutiny, when you talk about that, I think Bhutan is making, uh, uh, you know, a big uh, improvement uh, because uh, just about uh, two months ago, we had uh, local elections, uh, which is like, uh, you know, local governance. So I think there was, a, when you talk about data, you know, so, so important. Without data, you can talk 101 things, we cannot come to the conclusive decisions how gender sensitive scrutiny can be uh, researched or the uh, come to be a very effective tool uh, in our everyday life. So I think uh, before talking about uh, gender sensitive scrutiny, how effective and how it should be is in the uh, earlier one or two panelists were talking about that we have to have uh, Everything has to be in decision making inclusiveness, you know, inclusiveness and uh, representative uh, from all walks of life, you know, uh, not just uh, women, not just minorities, not just, uh, you know, uh, how should I say? Uh, so, I mean, you know, we have to be very inclusive. And I'm very fortunate today here uh, in, in, a, in the second panelist, I am the only man, I am the only male. And I'm honored to be, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, gender sensitive scrutiny. But again, coming back to my own uh, experiences in, in the past three years, Bhutan is making a big jump and big improvement. Because uh, as I said, again, in by-election, we have another woman joined us in our ruling, uh, as a ruling government. Uh, and then the, in the local government, we had almost 32% uh, jump from the 15% uh, about uh, uh, five years ago. So, I mean, definitely women are showing so much interest. And I'll talk about, uh, you know, uh, affirmative action or we can, one can call it a gender action plan. So we are even thinking of, you know, <laughs> to, to have a, all together the funding, separate funding for the women's for the women participation, for their encouragement. We want women to come forward and show some, you know, interests and come forward. But uh, what we can do is a few things that uh, which will support women's participation in the parliament is that uh, we need to have a separate uh, funding for them so that uh, we can encourage women. And uh, also to, to, to say by, uh, through my own experience, the highest ranking in the highest position in the civil servant in Bhutan, we have foreign secretary is a woman. She was five years in, uh, in, in Brussels as the ambassador of Bhutan. And we have another lady who's, who's an ambassador of Bhutan in New York. And, and you must have seen recently in the General Assembly uh, where 143 countries supported uh, Ukraine 
And Bhutan happened to be one of the countries. And she made a very remarkable speech in the General Assembly. And we have another few sec uh, women who are in the secretaries now. Minister of Finance, which is very important. And lady, uh, the, there's a wom woman who's heading as a secretary. Now we have an education ministry secretary is also women. We have a woman who's also secretary in the labor ministry. So, you know, I think uh, in the last few years, through my own experience, I saw many women in, in, in Bhutan coming forward and taking the important steps. So I think these are the few, if you can say, you know, uh, gender sensitive scrutiny. This is my own scrutiny. Thank you so much. I Thank you so come much. I found out that uh, women are doing very well in Bhutan. And uh, in the last few, uh, few years only, we have seen a lot of women uh, showing improvement and interest in the parliament. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for talking about your country and to talk about the progress that's being made on gender equality there. Um, we are running very, very short of time. Uh, we did start a little late. Um, I'm just going to ask two of you to, um, if you have one thing that you would advise other MPs to do to embed gender in their oversight and lawmaking, what would it be? Um, Maria, Adela, can I come to you first? To be assertive. <laughs> that is I mean, <laughs> yeah, to be assertive because, um, well, personally, I haven't found any barriers in uh, um, in proposing this uh, uh, gender impact assessment. But of course, for some topics, you need to be assertive. You need to uh, let your MPs, your colleagues know that this is a really important topic because we're talking about half of the society. And if we can uh, um, increase gender equality, if, in, if we can increase the, um, the, the, the situation, the life of women, of course, all the society is impacted. The fragile, disabled, men, women, boys, girls, everybody is impacted. But, um, well, at least in Italy, okay, I'm talking just about my country, but sometimes I don't see um, this, uh, I, I think that people don't understand the big issue. They don't understand the importance of this topic. So I always talk with colleagues and, well, male, male colleagues, most of all, and I tell them, look, it's not my problem. It's not just my problem. Um, it's, a, it's a problem for the whole society because uh, there are sisters, there are wives, there are mothers. It, it impacts the whole society. So the, the advice for me could be be assertive, good, mm, prepare good uh, laws, um, try to be as coherent as possible and study a lot because in uh, also for politicians, you need to study, study, study every day in order to, uh, to and also study good practices. So yeah. even for, you know, good, good practices of, our, of other countries, uh, because if you study, you can have also, you can prepare and you can propose also better policies and laws. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, Fuzia, can I come to you just very, very quickly what your one thing, what your one piece of advice would be for other MPs? I, um, in my experience, Hannah, uh, being assertive is, I agree on being assertive is very important, but I find that um, finding um, male partners who will champion the issue uh, work very well, especially in our society. Sometimes they don't, they feel a bit intimidated if the, the women are very assertive. Um, so I lobby a lot with my male colleagues and I get them to speak up <laughs> and I find that works as well. <laughs> so apart from all the other things that we've got to do, um, we have to be, we have to really understand what we are championing, uh, what we are fighting for and asking. We must know the exact outcome. It must, we must be able to measure the outcome that we want. And then we get it done um, in many ways and get pe other people also to say the same things that we want to say. So when everybody echo it, for example, uh, currently we are trying to um, review the sexual harassment bill that's been tabled. So we, we feel there's a lot of loopholes. So we get the men talking about it as well. Yeah, review the sexual harassment bill. <laughs> so we get all the men echoing what we want to say. So I find that works as well. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Fuzia. Um, I'm really sorry to say that we're out of time. I could continue this discussion with you all um, for a long time after this, but hopefully we'll get to talk about it again soon. Um, thank you so much for contributing your time and happy International Women's Day week to you all. Um, I'm now delighted to hand the floor over to International Ideas Senior Expert on Diversity and Inclusion, Rumbidzai Kandawashika Unhundu, for some closing remarks. Rumbi, over to you. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you all uh, participants. Thank you, honorable members, for your very insightful and um, knowledge-based experiences that you have shared with us. In closing, I think I just want to amplify the issues that were emerging, because I know at the end of the day, there's so much that we can talk about and we can't finish everything here. But I think it's important to note that in all the discussions that we have had, starting from the session on the theory and principles on gender scrutiny, the emphasis really is on an institutionalized approach, not ad hoc approach, but institutionalized, institutionalized in terms of the processes, in terms of practices, and in also in terms of the culture. And I really liked the example that was highlighted, for instance, uh, by Honorable from Malaysia, which might seem like a very minor issue but it's very important in terms of the intervention of transforming the culture within parliaments, because it's not just the processes, it's not just the practices for the technicalities on lawmaking, oversight and representation, but it's the institutional culture itself. To what extent it can be a barrier for women's effective participation and representation in parliaments and ultimately for the achieving of gender equality. And I think it's important, the points that we raise, that gender equality scrutiny should not be tied up to how many women are in parliament, because both women and male men parliamentarians uh, in all their diversity. They are voted by also women and men, boys and girls in all their diversity. So the responsibility for gender scrutiny should not be placed on women who are essentially a minority, who are usually a minority in most of the parliaments, even though they represent a majority. I think it's important even the emphasis that gender scrutiny is for all policies not necessarily those that are perceived to be women specific, but it's for all policies. And the approach that was highlighted in the first session about using global benchmarks for setting gender sensitive scrutiny in a systematic way, such that it's an obligation, not an ad hoc, and also not a preference depending on which member of parliament is interested or not interested, but the fact that it has to be an obligation. And there are many ways for strengthening gender scrutiny from in terms of learning from each other. So parliaments don't have to feel that they are doing everything in solo or in a silo and uh, there are no experiences to draw lessons from. So the issue of peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing experiences is very fundamental, which is one of the anchors of the Inter-Paris project. And I think this part needs to be, component needs to be sustained and maintained throughout. As for the experiences, I found them, the experience from Italy, from, from uh, Malaysia, from Ireland, from Bhutan. I found them all complementing the theory and principle session. So, Every effort, there's the theoretical part, but there's also the implementable strategies and actions that have to be to be to be to be enforced and implemented. Equally important is the issue of actively engaging men and boys in the advocacy for gender equality, including gender scrutiny within parliaments. And if we can pull those multi-dimensional efforts and uh, strategies together, we can get somewhere because the frameworks are there. What needs is the creating of enabling environment based on transformative 
approaches that are sustainable and not ad hoc. So thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you very much to all the honorable members for sharing your lived realities and experiences that are very enriching. And to my colleagues at InterParis for organizing this event and all the participants that have joined us from all parts of the world. On behalf of International IDEA and the EU, our partner and funder, thank you so much. Asante Sana and best wishes for the International Women's Day month. <laughs> it will be a month. Let's celebrate it over the month. Thank you, my colleague, Hannah, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, wishing you all a, a great day. Thank you.